Uh, what's yes, your second sure. tip for us? Um, okay, so uh, English is equally snappy. Um, <laughs> when doing group work, make clear the group is responsible, not the individual. Ooh, I like it. Right, tell me more about this then. So, essentially, if you've, you know, like, in keeping with, I'm going to ask the student least likely to know, um, if the student gets it wrong following a group work task, it's the group that's getting blamed. You don't even mention the individual who's got it wrong. You like sometimes physically don't even I don't I actively avoid looking at them, and I'll turn my body to face the other three members of the group. Um, and like they might sometimes they might even be like, "Oh, sir, sorry, I, I meant to say." I was like, "No, no, 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 don't worry." And you just turn to them and say, "This is not about you. You've done your best. Like these guys just haven't helped you properly." Wow. And of course, they're, like you really like dramatize it all. Um, it's uh, it's a big pantomime. Um, but obviously, equally, if the group, if the person gets it right, you don't praise them at all. You massively just you say, "Data group, what an amazing job! They've understood that so clearly, and so they've explained every single bit of it." And I've questioned, you'll have questioned them, you'll have done stretch it questioning, and you'll have, you've really made sure you've given, maybe given them a different question that's similar, um, and they've they've got it. And you say to the group, "This is it's amazing, it's superb work." And like these two things, hand in hand, just but the group responsibility, it's. The, yeah, it's transformative. The first time I ever did it, um, so it was, it was a it was a teacher at school. We were talking about um, how to how to review tests, and we were talking about like I used to give students model solutions and like talk, tell them how to do it, and think I think I've done a quite a good job of explaining really clearly, which is part of it. Um, but they uh, then like someone said, "How do you know they've understood?" And I was like, "Oh." Good question. Um, maybe, maybe a retest sometimes if I have time. Um, but anyway, so they were like, we do group. Like, I do group work. Um, at the end, I project. Fo I send. Fo I put photos of their mistakes that I've taken um, whilst marking on the board, and that person has to explain um, like how to do that question. And if they can't, then I blame the group. And if they can, I praise the group. But w the first time I did this, um, it was an amazing tip from this guy that I worked with, and uh, I. I uh, physically like did this like whole turning away from the kid that got it wrong and like looked and told it like said to the group what's going on. You could see their minds being rewired. Like they were like, I've never even considered this before. Uh, wow. Um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> they always apologetic to the they've, like they tried, but they've just never had this kind of accountability before. Um, and it was yeah like it, it, since then since I, I can I can literally picture the moment in room twenty six or whatever it was <laughs> like it's it just uh, yeah it's, it's just a really great uh, thing to do. Right, Sammy, we've got to dive into this. You, you've blown my mind here with this one. Um, firstly, just a, 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 on a practical question, I'm, I always love the idea of getting kids work up onto the board kind of as quickly as possible. You're taking photos. Just talk us through that. What um what what app are you using? What tech are we what tech are we talking here? Yeah, so um. I, I use Cam Scanner, um, which it's just a, a photo to PDF converter. Um, but like, just as I'm marking, if I see a really good mistake, um, take a photo. Yeah. I write on my sort of like work solutions that I've just got just for myself, so that before I start marking, I write their name, that student's name on that question on the, on the on my test. And I do this maybe like three or four times um, for different students' mistakes that are like nice mistakes, that are common misconceptions, or you know things that we've talked about during the unit, and yet they've still made that mistake. Whatever it may be, um, and then I set like use this cam scanner app, and it kind of does like a nice kind of um, uh, like editing thing, so the colours are brighter and clearer. And then you just email it to yourself, and I just open up the email, and then at the end of the review, you, before the review, you say like I'm going to project mistakes. On the board, the people better be ready to answer. Could be anyone, anyone at all, and it, and it really could be anyone at all. Like, um, I quite often target um, pupil premium students and like lower attaining students, but like just because I think that's a generally good rule to follow for things if you're not in, if you're in two minds. But more important is the like the mistake that's been made if it's a really nice mistake. Anyway, um, after the after the when the, when the review part of the groups is finished, then it's just like one mistake at a time. This mistake is, and you can sometimes see the kid whose mistake it is, or the group who's. You really know they've got it when the group are like, "This is this is so and so, right? Here we go." Um, and then uh, and yeah, you just say right, it's your turn. You talk talk us through it. Um, and then if they if they do it, then obviously you, you praise the group. Um, and if they don't, you blame the group, like to varying degrees of. Um, like severity of consequence like it might be just say um 
they don't understand it well. Like sometimes I, I, it's quite harsh, but like they, they explain it, but then you kind of stretch it a bit. You ask them some more questions and follow questions and they get a bit stumped. And like you, I would do that for if, if the, the group members that helped them were really high attainers. Mm. And I was just trying to like challenge them even more and be like, look, look at the questions that I've asked. Did you ask these questions? And they'll be like, no. And I know that because this person has not been able to answer these questions. This is what you've got to be doing. So it might be like that, quite measured um, and like really, really high expectations of what I like, want them to do in their groups. But it might also be, this is quite a basic mistake. There's no way you should have like not got this wrong. So you lot, it's not a detention, mm. you've not misbehaved, but you're going to stay behind until this person can explain it. It happened today in my year 11 lesson, actually. Um, like they, they do a paper homework of like, mixed exam questions from um uh their most recent like prep test that they're doing actually this is this is a, another teaser for later on but anyway um <laughs> they they come in they do this every day after each lesson they come in um and they immediately the, the answers on the board and they immediately start doing group work review um because I've, I've taught them for like four and a half years now so they've done a lot of group work and they're quite they, they're, they're all right at it. and um but at the end of the 20 minutes they have to do this, I then like pick someone. And the student who I picked was a student who actually missed the last lesson and hadn't heard the explanation. Um, but like, I, it's, it's the crunch time, he has to know what to do for these questions. So I just said like, this, this, class, this group's got to stay. And then at the end, they had to stay for 20 minutes, 20 out of like 35 minute lunch, which was annoying for me and them because I wanted to get my lunch. Yeah, but they just, yeah. he, he wasn't getting it. and they, like they, they had to do it and they, they didn't complain because they know how it works and they, they do want him to understand. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the other end of the, the severity. God, so many, so many questions on this. Let, let me just make sure I've definitely got my head around this, this, this cam scam app. You're taking the photo, it converts it to a PDF. You'll send, you're just emailing it to yourself straight away. Then you can just go to your kind of tower at the front or whatever, crack open the email and it's on the board. Is that, is, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Love it, it, love it. Right, groups. So first question about this, I'm intri intrigued by the type of tasks that you're setting for your group. It's because whenever I've used group work in the past, it's been the more kind of investigative, open-ended, less structured things. I'm getting the sense that you're using it for a kind of a, a, a broader range of activities. Can you just describe some of the things that you may get your kids working in groups to do? Yeah, so there's, um, before, like, uh, like, before we start group work, um, it's good, you have to know the reason that you're doing it. And mm. in my mind, there's three good reasons. There's uh, generating ideas, just, just generating ideas. Doesn't apply so much in maths. Um, occasionally it does, but yeah. not, not loads. Uh, processing or practicing something. So you might think of it as the we do part of the lesson, but it's not necessarily teacher led. So usually we do is the teacher, obviously guiding students through questioning or whatever. But it might be that the knowledge is in the room, but it's not, it's not like, um, it's not consolidated yet and it would be beneficial for them to have the opportunity to kind of explain rehearse um just question each other a little bit to like test out little misconceptions because some of them will know and some of them won't um and that one by the way is a bit risky because if they do have misconceptions then obviously those can get perpetuated so you've got to be really careful with that um and the third one is when you know the knowledge is in the room because you've tested them somehow it might be mini whiteboards it might be a topic test it might be a big big assessment um and you've marked their work or you told them who's right and who's wrong and you expect them to teach each other. Um, so those are the three reasons that I would use group work, like pretty much not for, at all for investigation. Um, yeah, because I think with investigations, like, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's never a time and place for it um, at all because like, I... It's like often lessons can take all kinds of forms and like it, sometimes it's just good to have something really exciting which actually mm. isn't going to help them necessarily do really well in an exam um but if it's exciting and worthwhile and maybe relevant and whatever then I, I, they're definitely like i'm all for it um but i think with investigations like once someone's realized and then they just tell the group yeah. that the, the investigation is not a thing yeah. um, anymore for those people so if i'm ever trying to get them to spot patterns or whatever it's more, I'll be like, looking at this board, can you see a pattern here? And I'll give them real time, like silent time, and then they put their hand up if they think they've spotted a pattern. And, uh, and then I'll get a gauge of the room at least to see if they think they've understood, which is very yes. different if they have understood. But I think that, that has to be done um, silently. And actually a lot of things need to be done silently. Um, things where once you're told, then there's no more thinking. Um, like, uh, let's think of an example. Done badly, well, uh, like, so some, some, some questions really lend themselves to group work, regardless of how good the students are at group work. 
Um, so trying to find the area of a compound shave just because like, um, or the area of a shave section, I think even if they're not very good at questioning and stuff, um, without much subtlety, they can help students get to the answer without just telling them. Right. Whereas, by contrast, like let's say factorizing quadratic expressions, um, I know this is math specific, um, but if, if you're not very, very, very good at helping people, you might just tell them what goes in the brackets and then like, then there's no worth to the group work and so that kind of thing needs to be done silently individually because they need to get used to thinking in the right way um, so you have to be really careful about your when like when you when is a good time to use group work um, and it can vary from topic to topic and it can vary from lesson to lesson uh, and subject to subject it's fast. Uh, the problem here, Sam, is everything you say, I then write down three more questions of th things to ask you. So I mean, I'm intrigued here. Well, ju just a very quick question on this. We, group work, ever, would you say majority of lessons would involve some form of group work for you? Would that be fair? Yeah, very, like, as I say, quite rarely generating ideas. Um, but usually, like, e even if it's just mini whiteboards, if, they're, if, let's say, two thirds of the class have got it right and a third haven't, or even less, let's say, half and half, and it's fairly evenly spread throughout the room. Um, with the students trained up well in group work, I think it's the most productive way to deal with mistakes. Once they know who's right, um, if you just explain it from the front, half of them it's irrelevant to. Yeah. Um, and if you, um, you can't move on because there's not enough of them in the classroom yep. who know. So like, I can't really imagine teaching without that as my fallback option, because not only does it provide the support for those that got it wrong, but yeah. the ones who got it right, I, like I really believe it's really powerful for them to challenge them to get them to think deeply about it to help someone yeah. to understand. Just um, on that, Sammy. So I, I have the exact same strategy, but I, I don't have the group accountability at the end. So it never works as well, right? Because it's the the thing there is the the kids who've got it right. Sure, I'm saying to them, explain to you know your partner who's struggling, blah blah blah. But if they do, they do. If they don't, it doesn't matter. But then if if, I, if I'm holding them account, if their partner can't explain it, whoa, then the, the incentives and stakes are there. So, right, I'm, I'm, I'm on to that one. Here's yeah. my question for you, Sammy. Well, does paired work play a role here at all? Is, is, there, is, it, is it either independent, silent work and group work, or is, is, there, is there room for paired work? I, I, I bracket paired work. Um, pretty, it's, it's, it's pr the principles apply as they do to group work, yeah. um, the same principles. The only thing is, if you're using pairs rather than groups, the best thing about, like, the lowest number of people, if you've got eight groups in the class, eight groups of four, let's say, um, you need eight students in the room to have understood something properly for the yes. group work to work. Yeah. If you have pairs, you need 16. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it makes it harder to do the teaching and to do the, the processing becomes a little bit more risky. The teaching is harder. Um, it's, it's just a little bit harder, I think. Um, like what, what sometimes happens when they're doing group work is they might naturally just fall into a group of two and two and like if they're having different yes. conversations but I really um, emphasize to them that's okay but they have to be checking each other's pair as well um, like you have to the people on your table you're responsible for even if you've been talking individually with something because it's worked out that you're going to fix that while someone else fixes that yes. you still need to grab their test look at their purple pen note and I'm, if, I, if they get it wrong and I ask them later on I'm still going to be like looking at you to say what's happened I like it. I like it. Right. Final few just questions, logistic questions on group work. And then if there's anything else you want to add that we haven't covered, please do, Sammy. So um, where to start here? Size of groups? Would it tend to be fours or would that, would that depend? Yeah. So uh, three, um, so two to four um, works. Five is hard uh, like, because then it's harder to ensure that you're not getting... Um, people doing nothing and yeah. it's harder for the kids to notice when people aren't doing anything as well um, and what you often find is a five turns into a three and a two and, yeah. then, and it's harder to hold them to account as a group when the one on the, the, the one from the two is on one end of the like desk and the one from the three on the other end like it's quite hard for them to hold yeah. them, like look after each other but it's still I mean in all honesty like I've got quite big classes with my year eights and nines and we do often have five and it does work it's just um, a little bit harder Got it. Um, choice of kids in the group? Are you grouping them in any specific way? I like to have, um, you know, let's say you've got eight groups, highest attaining, second highest attaining, third highest attaining, fourth, all the way down to eight. And then yeah. I will take the ninth highest attaining and put them on the table with the eighth. 
and then go backwards the other way. Okay. And then I'll go again and then again. Um, obviously, all of this relies heavily on behaviour and yeah, yeah, personality yeah. clashes. And so, like, and honestly, with my year 11s, there's so many personalities in there. <laughs> it's entirely, it's in, sadly entirely about personality, pretty much. Like, I, I've made sure there's a there's a high attainer on each group, but beyond yeah. that, it's about who's going to work well with who and not get distracted. But with my year eights it's pretty much exactly by the book um like that and basing it on is it static because that was going to be my follow-up question what 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 data are you kind of judging this on yeah so it's um obviously informed by summative assessment data but summative assessment data is always limited and i feel like so we i'm fortunate enough to have taught my classes since they arrived in year seven all of them so i know them really well and so i i wouldn't I, i my gut and what they understand is much better than yes. the summative data. But it also, I think what summative assessment data is really, really useful for flagging up students that know less than you realise. Um, but I think there are students that know loads that might do badly in a test, in a big test. And so I wouldn't, um, it's obviously, it's worth seeing. It's like, it's very yeah, useful yeah. data because something's gone wrong for them. But um, it, I'd be much more willing to say, that's a bad day for them compared to a student who's done really, really bad, really badly, and is like bottom of the class. I'm like, yes. that's major alarm, alarm bells. But would uh, you I, would I, would the group would you change the groups a fair bit then? So after, so I, I it, based on new summative data. Yeah, or just any, just anything. How, how long would a group kind of stay in place before yeah, its members it's, were shuffled a bit? It's a great question, um, which I've been thinking about recently because I realised with my year uh, eight it's been pretty much static since the start of this year um so that's what uh seven months yep. um the advantages of this is that they start to they start to understand their own like, yeah. groups within the groups and they can start to really work towards that and fill yes. those gaps which is amazing um and they also they also over time start to really care and like there's um when we do tests sometimes i'm well if, if a group occasionally a whole group let's say the whole group gets 100 percent or something like that you can say to the class, you know, obviously it's great when a kid gets 100%, but if you say to the class, yeah. this group here yeah, has good. looked after each other so much in the last few weeks in the topic that we've been doing with that's them. Nice. Every single one of them has got 100%, and they look at each other, and you can see they're really proud of each other, and it's just, it's, it's class. And, um, yeah, that, so, so that, that's, that's stopping me moving around. Yeah, of course. Then, then, equally, when they, um, as discussed with Year 11, like, sometimes they become very familiar with each other and it, it just takes, it, it can mean that they get overly comfortable. Um, yes. And then obviously you put in the accountability measures to stop that happening, but sometimes just changing it up um, gives them a fresh impetus and they're not familiar, they're not so familiar, so they're a bit more professional about it. And uh, yeah, this is all like, I definitely don't have an answer. I, I should have probably started with by saying, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, it's just, this is what I'm, I've been going around in my head recently as I think about it, because it's been now seven months since the start of the year and there, haven't, have, there hasn't been much movement. Um, I think if it's working, then keep it. Of I course. Think it's a simple solution. Um, and if you have a feeling that it might not be, or you have a feeling it could be better, then, then, try, then just change it up. Um, which I guess applies to a lot of things, if not everything, so. <laughs> This is great, Sammy. Last two questions for me on, on, on group work. I could speak to you all, all night on groups. Um, I'm intrigued by your room layouts. Well, how do you have your desks? Um, so I've got, uh, if we, so let's say rectangular room. Yeah. And there's a teacher desk in the corner. Yeah. Where, um, so if you're facing the board at the front, the teacher desk is to the right. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, it's, I've tried this for the first time this year. I've never liked it being horizontal or, well, perpendicular or parallel to the board of the yeah. board. So I've tried just moving it quite grotesquely 45 <laughs> degrees, um, which is strange, but like it's working for me. I'm liking it um, because like, there's all kinds of reasons you might want to do that. But um, I like the fact that I can see the board teach from the front on my laptop if I'm sat down. Um, like modeling, but can also see the class at the same time. Yes, okay, yeah. So anyway, yeah. It's, got, it's, it's a good combination. Um, but then but in front of me, so if we're still facing the front of the room with the board at the front and the desk to the far right corner, yeah. there's in front, directly in front of me, there's there's a group of four and a group of four behind that, yeah. the bottom right now. Um, and so, the and then there's two more rows of groups, 
the middle row has three groups of four. Yeah. And the left row, I should probably should be saying columns, the left column has three more groups of four as well. Got it. And is it the kids, I assume like when you're modeling or whatever, it's quite easy for them to all be facing the front. This was always, the reason I'm saying this, this is always one of my big arguments, in, internal arguments, why I think, no, no, I always prefer rows just because the kids are facing the front. Yeah, it's, it? a good, it's a really good question. I, like, a, again, um, <laughs> grotesquely have tilted the desk 45 degrees and the ones at the side, <laughs> nice. the ones at the side of the room they're tilted 45 degrees so that the yeah. ones who would otherwise be kind of having to turn around yes. to see the board only have to sort of tilt ahead a little bit right um, okay that's nice so the, all desks um if you look at the if you look at a sort of plan view of the room would be facing towards the board um at some sort of angle so that to minimize the amount they have to turn got it got it perfect and last question and it's the worst question sammy um, I, I would love to get kids to the stage where they can do this working groups like you can. How, how long do you reckon it takes and what are some of the things, what are some of the things that are, you've learned that are essential to put into place in those early kind of lessons where they're getting to grips with this? Um, I think genuinely the difference when I started just blaming the group, um, which is what I guess this tip is all about, yeah. and praising the group, that was like an overnight clear difference. Nice, um, nice. Which is like ridiculous because these things never work like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then the uh, the it's they never arrive. We never arrive. We never like we're never going to get to the point where we're perfect in anything. Yeah, but yeah. we aspire to get better and better. And it's the same for the group work. I think in the trajectory it'll go up and down a little bit and then up a bit more and down a little bit more but ultimately there'll be a positive trend if you keep yeah. practicing yeah and um you can kind of start adding new things like like with my year i've got top set year nine at the moment um who i've had since year seven and midway through year seven i started you had to build up the accountability just in them understanding what how it was working but then maybe after a few months you can then start to like doing it regularly in mm. a lot of lessons mm. and doing all the all the consequences and whatever it may be um starting to teach them to question each other um which adds a completely new uh, layer to yes. it and honestly like some of their questioning is ridiculous like they they teach me a thing or two <laughs> um, and the way they scaffold and guide through questioning and like but then once you open that up then you hit a, another huge increase in like productivity yes um and so anyway like i think it was just practicing for a few months well you'll start to notice a difference um but that overnight transformation of just suddenly blaming and praising the group will like is it is really good sometimes I, I should probably like i feel like i should say just make sure that you're judging the situation well because i can just imagine like a slightly spicier group of kids suddenly being like <laughs> what i'm getting blamed for this like yeah, this, yeah, kid has, yeah. this kid hasn't been listening and like and you have to really make sure that you're um separating bad behavior like if one of the kids isn't engaging like that's a different thing to group work accountability yes. um and i don't want people to suddenly find themselves getting loads of fights with kids um <laughs> because they've like you know held them to account with group work in a way they'd never thought about before but um the principle is there that's great i, I said last question Sammy, but i've just thought of one more so i do apologize I'm intrigued by what you're doing as a teacher whilst the kids are working in their groups uh, on two levels here. One, because you mentioned a potential problem with group work is that the kids can be practicing the wrong things, misconceptions can be going around. So I'm in intrigued how you're keeping on top of that. But also, I mean, I'm intrigued by a point I first heard Colin Foster make that as teachers, sometimes we can really get in the way of kids thinking like the kids will be having a great discussion and we'll be hovering at the back. And all of a sudden, either the discussion shuts down or the kids feel they need to perform or it just becomes stilted. So what, what are you doing as a teacher whilst your kids are, kids are doing the group work? Yeah, great question. Um, trying not to, get, uh, not to get involved as much as possible yeah. and trying to keep every group in view as much as possible. So I stand in the corner so that I only have to turn a quarter turn to see the whole room. Nice. And I try my best to zone into conversations as much as I can. Um, so that I can figure out whether misconceptions are being perpetrated, but also just like figure out if they're on task yeah. in a really basic level. And if I have a suspicion that they are off task, tr 
try really hard to listen to that conversation and try, try and read body language. But also, if it's not working, subtly try and move to that part of the room whilst still keeping the rest of the class in view. And then you can like maybe do that thing I was talking about where you let them play it out and then you pick someone and you'd be like, yeah. right, I was listening. You might not have thought it because I was stood on the other side of the room, but I was listening and I can tell. Like, it might have been that. Um, what That's like if you... Most of the time you'll have to do that, I think, and that's a good thing to do. What I've started doing with this year nine class is um, when they're doing their group work, uh, because their behaviour is excellent, um, and it's very, very rare that I've noticed them being off task, um, I go around with a mini whiteboard and basically just listen. And it's like I'm observing a trainee teacher or whatever, Just I'm just writing down what were well and even better ifs in terms of their, their help. And then every so often I'll just stop the class and give a few individuals feedback publicly. Um, so it might be modelling a bad conversation, it might be modelling a really nice line of questioning which took their partner to the right answer. Um, it, but just like basically just giving them feedback um, as I would a teacher and that's it's a, it's a it, that's you have to model what good conversations look like yes. um, and that is one way of doing it it's great Sammy I, I want to completely change how I teach here listen to this it's, it's brilliant stuff 